Hello, there we go. Hi everyone, um, good afternoon and welcome. Uh, my name's Ben and I head up the events at uh, UCLU Christian Union and uh, me and Tom over there are going to be taking you through uh, this lunchtime's proceedings. Um, just to say that there there's a few spare chairs running around. Um, if you're sat next to a spare seat, you might want to kind of flag it um, through in. There's one over here and there's two down here. There's one over there. Um, but yeah, uh, welcome. Uh, so today we're going to be um, looking at one of the oldest and probably most difficult um, philosophical questions. Morality, is there a right way to live? And um, to tackle it with us, it's my great pleasure to um, introduce Professor John Wyatt. Uh, professor Wyatt is um, Professor of uh, Ethics and Perinatology, which is Medicine of Birth, um, here at UCL. Um, and he also... Um, used to be, although he's retired now, he used to be a consultant paediatrician at University College Hospital, uh, where he specialised in intensive care of newborn babies. Um, the way it's going to work uh, is Professor Wyatt is going to speak for about 25 minutes to half an hour, um, after which there'll be time for Q&A. Um, there are two ways that you can ask questions. Either you can uh, stick your hand up and we'll pass this mic around, or alternatively, at any point throughout the talk or the Q&A, you can text your questions to uh, the numbers which are on the walls there. Um, that will come straight to me, um, and I'll read out uh, your text. And just to say, uh, we will delete all messages and all numbers from the phone at the end of the event. Okay, that's more than enough from me. Um, there are some seats here if people are looking for them. Um, but ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor John Wyatt. Great. Well, thanks very much. It's a real uh, privilege to be here. Although I have to admit, as I was walking here, just down from Euston Station, I was thinking, why on earth did I agree to do this? I must be mad. Because <laughs> clearly this is not an easy topic. It's difficult, it's contentious, and many people, in fact most people would say, it's just downright foolhardy to even attempt to ask a question like this, especially at a big university, especially in the centre of London, especially with everything that's going on around the world. So anyway, I'll do my best. If you've come expecting some nice, slick, simple answers to difficult, painful questions, then you're going to be deeply disappointed, because I haven't got any nice, slick, simple answers. In fact, I genuinely believe there aren't any nice, slick, simple answers. But I hope at least we can think together about this difficult topic, and I hope we can uh, think about some of the fundamental issues which face us. Uh, and above all, at a university, a university ought to be a place where it's possible to raise these profound, difficult, challenging questions and have an open dialogue and discussion. That's all I'm asking for. It's clearly a vast topic, and you can see the way that human beings have been discussing these kind of issues from the dawn of time. And certainly by the time you get to the writings, the ancient religious writings, including the writings of the Torah and the Old Testament, and uh, ancient religious writings, and then you get to Socrates and Plato and Aristotle, these are some of the central issues which human beings have debated and the greatest minds of the age. And in fact, it's a major preoccupation of modern philosophy. And uh, I just downloaded a vast 800-page anthology of, discu of discussion of moral philosophy uh, just yesterday, and uh, it was just illustrative of this, the kind of amazing amount of work going on in this area. But as you've heard, I'm actually not a philosopher. My background is as a baby doctor. The reason I got interested in ethics and moral philosophy is because of the, the challenge of facing uh, practical clinical ethical dilemmas uh, on the shop floor, and particularly life and death issues. And uh, these, these are genuine issues, I, and I think it's really important, you know, what we're talking about today is much more than just moral philosophy, and just much more than a sort of casual conversation which you might have with a pint in your hand. Because the truth is that questions of morality, questions of good and evil go right to the heart of what it means to be human and what's more at some stage in your life you will be faced you personally will be faced with some profound life and death moral issues uh, you may have already been been faced with that um, but uh, if, if you haven't already I can guarantee it's going to happen it's happened to me repeatedly not just in my work as a, as a neonatologist as a baby doctor but also as a human being uh, for instance, caring for my mother who had profound dementia and who'd become very uh, disabled and incontinent and who then developed a chest infection 
What's the right thing to do in that situation? Should we give her antibiotics? She's completely unable to make this decision herself. We can't have any kind of conversation with her. Is it right to allow her to die? That, that, that became a very profound moral question for me myself. And as we all know, these kind of moral issues hit the headlines. This was from 2012, and this is an ordinary high school teacher who went to work one day. And as she went to work, she didn't think she was going to be faced with any kind of great moral dilemma. It was just an ordinary day. And then, lo and behold, as she's in the primary school, a shooter appears with an assault rifle. And she has to make a snap decision. She, there she is with a class full of young children, and she has to make a snap decision. Do I go running? Here is this guy advancing with a, a rifle, and she, and she, as the accounts, the first-hand accounts say, she deliberately shielded the kids. Uh, she, she tried to get them away from them, and she put her own body between the kids and the gunman, and she was gunned down and died. And so, instantaneously, she took a moral decision: Is it right to sacrifice your own life? to try and protect the lives of others. Is that the right thing to do or is it the wrong thing to do? This is highly topical. Just today the newspapers are filled with the news about this chap who is an aid worker who chooses, a, a, makes a moral decision. I'm going to go to Syria and I'm going to uh, help uh, people who are in, in, in deep need. And uh, another moral decision is taken by people there and he is uh, murdered and beheaded and the video is sent around the world and Obama calls it pure evil, there's the language there's the language of morality and now is it true objectively to say that there is any difference between the actions of Peter who chose to go voluntary to Syria to try and help and the actions of the people who beheaded him who chose voluntarily to behead him. Is there any difference in, in, in those actions? And there is, uh, this is an extreme example, but, but you know, these are, this is, these are real issues in the world. And there certainly is a position, uh, a respectable moral position, that says that in the end, these, these decisions are entirely relative. Uh, the position of moral relativism, and this is one version of it, there's in fact many different versions of it, but there's, the truth or falsity of moral judgments or their justification is not absolute or universal, it's relative to the traditions, convictions or practices of a group of persons. So in other words, the moral relativist would come along to this situation and would say, well, okay, so Peter was acting according to his own moral traditions and, and about care and charity and, and, and so on, and the ISIS leaders were acting according to their own convictions and traditions, and, and basically there is no difference between the two. Uh, fundamentally, we may say we like one, we think he's a nice man and we think they're nasty men, but we can't go any further than that. In the end, these actions are equivalent. That's, that's the position that moral relativism said. Not surprisingly, moral relativism, outside a few senior common rooms, academic philosophy departments, is not generally uh, supported. And I think most of us, well it would be interesting to see, maybe there are some people who want in the Q&A to say, yes, I'm a moral relativist. I think most of us can say, that can't be right. There must be something more to morality than just simply traditions, cultural practices, and so on. What's really interesting is about the language of morality is very unusual language. It's quite different from the rest of the language you use to describe human behaviour and so on. So this kind of language, good, evil, just, unjust, fair, not fair, should, should not. Very interesting that if you look at children at a very, very early stage, this language develops. Even at two or three year olds, one of the first things a toddler learns to say is, it's not fair. <laughs> In other words, that language about morality is not something, some sophisticated uh, superstructure which is obtained through education and, and reading the classics and uh, thinking about Plato and so on. No, it's something deeply rooted uh, in, in humankind and it is different language from language, for instance, nice or not nice. We all again understand about nice and not nice, like, don't like, but this language is not the same as like, don't like. It is fundamentally different in, in, its, in its nature. 
There's some very interesting neuroscience about um, moral language, including some of the work done here at, at UCL. Uh, and I haven't time to review it in any detail, but uh, we could can be happy to talk about this in a bit more if, you, if you're interested. But it appears there's a lot of evidence that moral decisions are in many ways hardwired, or at least a, a way of a moral analysis, the ability to analyse um, behaviour from a moral uh, perspective, it seems to be hardwired into the nervous system. And this is just one example of a, a study where volunteers were asked to, to, uh, to see a video enactment of various actions. And in some of the videos, there were uh, accidental injury. Was, so somebody was accidentally hit uh, with a golf club. And in, another, in the same, another video, it was clear that there was just an enactment that, that um, somebody was deliberately hit, that the intention was to harm. It was just clear from the video enactment. And what was seen was the responses in the brain. And uh, it turned out that you could show an, an incredibly rapid response to the intentional harming video, which didn't happen in the accidental harming video. And it happens within tens of milliseconds. So uh, you get uh, uh, arousal of particular areas of the brain which are known to be associated with moral processing uh, occurring within uh, tens and hundreds of milliseconds. In other words, much faster than the ability to stop and think and say that's not right. That nasty man shouldn't have done that. It just happens instantaneously. That's wrong. Now, of course, how you interpret that, some people can interpret that just to mean, well, this is just it's a, it's a reflex which is hardwired into the nervous system. There's nothing we can do about it. I personally think that's, you, you can't interpret that evidence that way, but it certainly tells us that moral processing is something which is very fundamental to what it means to be human, and it's something, the ability to process uh, the, the morality of actions is, is hardwired into the nervous system, and in fact we recognise that there are a small number of individuals who's, where this kind of processing is very difficult, and they find it difficult to understand the difference between right and wrong, and we, th these are profoundly troubling uh, individuals who, who may end up as psychopaths or sociopaths in our society, but they're seen as people who are profoundly abnormal or damaged in some way. So, as you heard, my own work was been working mainly with extremely sick and critically ill newborn babies, and um, just down the road in the uh, UCH, in the neonatal intensive care unit, and uh, as technology has advanced, we've been able to keep smaller and smaller babies, babies with real critical illnesses, um, alive longer and longer. But as the technology advances, and this is just a view from some years ago from the highly technological part of a baby intensive care unit, one of the problems in a baby intensive care unit is to find the patient. So that is actually the baby's head, and that's the body. And all the rest is the technology, which is keeping a very sick and critically ill baby alive. As the technology advances, we get better and better at picking up problems. This is an MRI scan of a premature baby, and there is bleeding inside the centre of the brain. This white area is here. And we're able to predict with a certain amount of accuracy what the long-term consequences for this baby might be in terms of cerebral palsy, in terms of risk of epilepsy, in terms of possible cognitive problems and so on. But then comes the ethics. If we know this, is it right to switch off, notice that moral language we've come to now, is it good, is it evil to switch off a life support system and allow a baby to die? Uh, and is it right that the doctors make that decision? Or is, this, is it right that the parents make the decision? And this is where we get into the ethics and into the challenges that modern technology brings. And, uh, you know, I've been working as a researcher in this area, particularly in the area of brain research, for uh, 30 years at UCL. I'm still involved in some uh, original research in this area. And, uh, you know, what, what research as a scientist has taught me is a certain amount of intellectual humility. I quite like this quote, which comes from a particle physicist, that reality is always stranger than you think. In fact, reality is stranger than you can think. Now, if that's true for particle physics... And, and the physical structure of the universe, well then maybe it's also true for the, the ultimate moral realities underlying the universe. Our simple ideas that we understand how things work and that it's all pretty straightforward may actually not be true. Reality may be stranger than we think. Again, it's what science research teaches you is that the obvious common sense answer to a scientific question is really always wrong and that you have to follow the evidence where it leads. So let's think a bit more about the evidence. Well, 
yes, there are huge ethical dilemmas in my f field. Um, this is a rather yellowing photo of, of, a, of a yellowing piece of paper. Um, at £20,000, it is worth keeping this baby alive. You can tell it's an old um, headline because the truth is, by modern day, it's about £100,000 to keep an extremely premature baby alive. And then again, there's a moral question. Is it worth? Is it right? Is it just? Is it appropriate? Some people are arguing that the right thing to do is to kill newborn babies who are unwanted, who, are, who will have an excessive, burdensome life. And so published in the prestigious New England Journal of Medicine was this uh, protocol saying, provided you meet these criteria, then it would be justified to kill a newborn baby. Is that right? Is that wrong? It's interesting that w they published this in the New England Journal of Medicine and they received uh, quite a lot of hate mail. I talked to one of the authors. He got hate mail from around the world uh, telling, saying, uh, much of it saying in probably unprincipled terms that he was evil and ought to be taken out and had the same euthanasia that he was suggesting for the newborn. So there were clearly quite a lot of people who didn't like what he was saying but then the question is how do we decide? There's another paper which I'm quite interested in published in in the uh, Journal of Medical Ethics, where a couple of moral philosophers argued that the same kind of arguments that can, ar can be used for abortion before birth could also be used for the making decisions about a newborn baby. And they said, let's not call it infanticide, let's call it after birth abortion. And uh, the Sun newspaper then decided to uh, have a headline, and this it approached this with its characteristic thoughtfulness and careful balance. <laughs> Slaughter newborn kids, say academics. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, anyway, the arguments were basically that the moral status of an infant is equivalent to that of a fetus, that is, neither can be considered a person. It's not possible to damage a newborn by preventing her from developing the potential to become a person in the morally relevant sense. So, in fact, there are a whole bunch of moral philosophers arguing that a newborn baby is not a person like you and me, and therefore doesn't have the same moral rights as you and I have, and uh, political and social rights, and therefore killing a newborn baby is, no, is not the same as killing an adult. And here's uh, Peter Singer, well-known philosopher, saying the decision to kill a newborn infant is no more and no less the prevention of the existence of an additional person than is a decision not to reproduce. In other words, he actually argues, and Singer, I've, I've actually had a public debate with Peter Singer um, on Newsnight some years ago. He does actually argue that, the, that, that contraception, abortion, and infanticide are all morally equivalent because they're all making a decision to stop a person coming into the world. And that from a moral basis, in terms of logic, uh, there's no difference. And he would then go on to say it's much better that we should do our morals in terms of logic rather than just in terms of fluffy emotions about babies and nice fluffy things and we should care for them. And I think a very important conclusion is that everybody is coming from somewhere. There isn't any neutral place once we start talking about morality. And I think it's very important because you sometimes get the impression from, from academics and public spokespeople and so on that there are these weird people who have beliefs, you know, these religious people, they've got all these weird beliefs. And then there's normal people like me. And I just follow the science. I just, I just do it logically and rationally. And so the implication is, of course, is that they're in some kind of neutral position and everybody else has the problem. But of course, that is basically just indefensible. Everybody has come from somewhere. Everybody has their own spectacles. Everybody has their own perspective. There is no neutral ground. So what I want to just in the remaining time is just look at ethics from two opposing and mutually contradictory perspectives. Now, of course, there are many different perspectives, and we haven't time to go and look at many of them. We, we could discuss some more of them afterwards if you want. But I'm just going to look at two. I'm going to look at the perspective of naturalism or, or scientific materialism, or sometimes called physicalism. They all basically mean the same things. And I'm going to look at it, surprise, surprise, from the perspective of the Christian faith. Maybe you're not that too surprised since this is organized, as a me meeting organized by the CU. So, let's think about scientific materialism. Scientific materialism basically says this, there is nothing but matter and energy, and any appearance of purpose, meaning, or significance is illusory. So Carl Sagan, very well-known American cosmologist and popularizer, said, is, summarized it in this pithy sentence, the cosmos is all there is, or was, or ever shall be. That's it. There is the stuff that the universe is made of. There is nothing else. 
And Richard Dawkins, as, useful, as usual, always good for a good quote, says, The universe we observe has precisely the properties we should express if there is at the bottom no design, no purpose, notice, no evil, and no good. Nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. As that unhappy poet A. E. Hasman put it, for nature, heartless, witless nature will neither care nor know. DNA neither cares nor know. DNA just is. And we dance with music. Now that is authentic naturalism. And it's absolutely, be- it's being intellectually honest. A lot of naturalists are not prepared to be as honest as Dawkins is. You may not agree with him, but he's being honest. Because what naturalism says is in the end, there is no design, no purpose, no evil, and no good. And of course naturalism comes along with a grand narrative, which we all know, the Big Bang, this huge boom of all these developments, many of them happen before three minutes of the, of the time, most of this is before three minutes, the universe is three minutes ages, and then you get gradual condensation of matter, you get uh, creation of planets, uh, of stars, which are the first generation of stars, they, they then burn out, and then out of the star dust, then create second generation stars, and eventually you get some planets, and uh, here is we, here we are on a, a tiny little insignificant planet and a tiny little insignificant star in a very unfashionable part of one of the arms of the Milky Way in a tiny little insignificant galaxy which is just one of more than 10 to the 11 galaxies and that's it that's where we are, and that's who we are, and that's, that's what naturalism has to say about us. And so, where on earth does all this good, evil, just, unjust language come from? Why is it, as carbon-based life forms that just happened to have a survival advantage on the African savannah, why is it that this kind of language matters so much to us? And the answer is, it has to be a construct of inventive human minds. It happens to give us a survival advantage on the African savannah. And this is the position which is often called moral subjectivism. Morality is just something we invent. We happen to have said, we've invented the idea that what Peter did going uh, abroad to care for children and and, and so on who were being bombed, we've invented that as a good thing. And what ISIS did, we've invented that to be a bad thing. But of course, it could have been the other way around. If it turned out that on the African savannah, the actions of ISIS turned out to be better than the actions of Peter, and you could think of reasons why actually that might turn out to be true on the African savannah, then we would of course have said that what the ISIS people were doing was good and what what Peter was doing was downright bad, uh, throwing his life away like that. So that is it. Basically, morality is constructed. And if you're a naturalist, you've basically got to accept that, that morality is constructed. It doesn't explain why the language of morality is so different from the language of preference, as I've said about taste and disgust. The British Humanist Association uh, takes this view, and uh, Raymond Tallis, who is a very well-known and uh, highly intelligent and uh, cr- creative writer, as well as being a physician, uh, but the, he says this, science expresses the greatest human values, our care for each other, and our wish to make sense of the world. And you know, it just, I'm afraid, Raymond Tallis has written some excellent stuff, but that sentence just doesn't make sense at all, because the truth is that science doesn't express the value of caring for one another. The Manhattan Project, which was happened in the Second World War was a huge, a huge uh, conglomeration of science, and the, the greatest scientific enterprise ever seen in the world at that stage. And its sole purpose was to create a nuclear bomb that would destroy as many lives as possible. And it was highly successful, and it led to Hiroshima. That was excellent science. But to say that science li- it expresses our care for one another is, I'm afraid, stretching the point. So can I do with? I'm nearly finishing, uh, and then ready to take some questions. So. I I think the idea that you can use science to find your morality is deeply flawed. And you can't reliably conclude from science what's good or evil. And that means that each one of us has, therefore, the right to choose or invent our moral code. That's so often where it leads on to. And this is going to be the liberal, secular understanding, which is often called the right of personal autonomy. Since we can't get it from science, in the end we have to just make it up for ourselves. Each one has the right to choose your own code of ethics. But unfortunately, this kind of liberal individualism often doesn't work in reality. And so here's Ayn Rand, another well-known philosopher, saying, if any civilization is to survive, it is the morality of altruism that men have to reject. In other words, this nice idea 
that just we're all everyone's going to be nice doesn't work in the real world of real politic. And C.S. Lewis, writing after the Second World War, uh, a Christian writer uh, who, was, who had, was presciently looking forward to the, the effects of technology, he said, man's power over nature turns out to be power exerted by some men over other men. Well, the language is very sexist, but we can actually see the, the, the power of what he's saying. That in other words, this simplistic idea that as science advances, it's going to mean that everyone is freer, everyone's going to get better, everyone's going to respond in a moral and wonderful way. You know, stop and think about it. Does, this, does the last uh, century teach us that history? I think the answer is it doesn't. And so again, this leads us dangerously close to this idea of moral relativism, which I've already seen doesn't make a lot of sense. Okay, well let me just sit back and then say, well, how does morality work from the perspective of the Christian faith? Now this is often caricatured as saying, well, there's some God up there, and he sort of creates everything, and he just arbitrarily says, I'm going to call that good, I'm going to call that bad, and then they call it the divine command theory. So there's a divine command which somehow floats down, and then we all have to obey it like little robots. Well, God up there said it's good, so it says it's bad. That's a complete caricature of, of, again, an extremely complex and rich subject, which is how Christianity teaches about morality. But what fundamentally the Christian faith teaches is that this category, this whole category of morality, and why it is that human beings uh, are expressed as morality, actually comes from the nature of God himself. That, that the God of the universe, the God who designed the universe, is a moral God is a God who understands and is the difference between good and evil, just and unjust, right and wrong. And he's in in some mysterious and and weird way, God has imprinted into the very structure of the cosmos, the very structure of reality, a a moral order is is how theologians talk about it. It's like a hidden grain in the wood. You know how wood has got this kind of grain, this structure, and if all well, people who work with wood discover that if you want to build a piece of furniture or create a piece of furniture, you have to work along the grain of the wood. And if you work along the grain, then it works. But if you work across the grain of the wood, you'll never be able to make something beautiful out of the wood. Now that's just some kind of analogy, but in the same kind of way, hidden in the, in the structure of the cosmos, what Christians claim is that there is some kind of hidden moral grain, some moral order. And if you live your life according to the moral order of the, of the cosmos, then your lives by and large will work. That doesn't mean you're not going to face all kinds of challenges, but by and large it'll work. If you live your life against the grain of the moral order, then fundamentally things are going to go wrong. And, you're going to, and, and that is uh, the fundamental understanding of morality. Not only that, but that in some weird and wonderful way, human beings are designed to reflect reflects the moral character of God himself. And so just as God is a moral God, human beings are moral. So morality comes from our creation, from the way that we're made. Uh, and I, I'm not thinking in sort of necessarily of some kind of simplistic understanding of creation. And again, that's a topic I'd be happy to talk about if you want to. But, but, but the, the Christian understanding is that God is in that creative process of how human beings came to be. And therefore, we carry within ourselves, as image bearers, we carry the same kind of morality. And then the Christian faith goes on to say something even more bizarre and frankly ludicrous, which is this, that God himself enters into the world and becomes a pathetic, fragile, vulnerable, carbon-based life form. And that in some weird way, he takes into his own body the physical stuff of the universe and he makes himself dependent and vulnerable and fragile. Now, of all the bizarrely stupid ideas, that this must be one of them. And, you know, you could think, and, and as, as actually the philosophers of the age, back 2,000 years ago, once they first heard this idea, the Christians talking about it, it was frankly ludicrous, offensive, disgusting. I mean, they could just about believe that the God of the universe might appear in, in some kind of mirage, in a vaguely human form, 
that the idea that God might physically, the, the God who held the whole universe together, might physically become a pathetic, vulnerable, real human being who squitted down his mother's back and, and had a pain in his tummy and vomited, and as was a, as a, a real human being. This, I mean, that's, this is offensive and ludicrous. And yet here we are 2,000 years later, and the sophisticated ideas of those philosophers of 2,000 years ago have largely been lost, and yet uh, over a billion people every year celebrate the idea of a God who becomes a human being. So there might just be something in this idea, and in this idea that when God breaks into human history, he comes as a pathetic, vulnerable, fragile, and dependent carbon-based life form. And therefore, ultimately, if we want to understand morality, what the Christian faith teaches us is, is we see it expressed in the teachings of the Bible, but ultimately in the life of Jesus himself, and that in the, in the presence of Jesus, God is revealing a way to live. I j I've run out of time, and I'm going to close. I just want to tell you the story of two very good friends of mine, Alan and Verity. And um, some years ago, they got married, and they were desperate to have a child. And um, the, the uh, wonderful news, she was pregnant. We uh, had a uh, celebratory dinner with them, and, th and then the news turned to tragedy because she'd had a whole test of scans, she'd had genetic tests, ultrasound scans. It turned out the baby had a lethal abnormality, a rare genetic abnormality, trisomy 18, Edwards syndrome, which is universally fatal. And in this situation, nearly everybody will say the right thing to do, the morally right thing to do, is to have an abortion. Because what possible reason can there be to put yourself through the whole pregnancy and to put your baby through the whole pregnancy and all the possible suffering? that that might have for no purpose the baby's going to die and so out of the blue our friends were confronted with a moral decision what is right what is wrong and a deeply painful and personal and difficult decision not just a philosophy textbook question but a real decision they had to face and after a lot of agonizing they felt the right thing to do was to love the baby that, that they had been given. And so little baby Christopher was born, and he had all the classic signs of Edwards syndrome. He was, uh, had severe brain abnormality, had heart abnormalities. To everyone's surprise, he didn't die straight away. And in fact, he survived for seven months. He was a tiny little scrap. He was, was 2.5 kilos. And um, they used to bring him along to the church where I go to in central London, All Souls Church. And uh, he became a celebrated member of the church. Everybody used to give him a cuddle and he, uh, he was the smallest member of the church community but he was one of the most famous and, and loved and celebrated and little baby Christopher survived for seven months and then he got weaker and, he, and, he, and eventually died and at the memorial service 450 people came to, to pay tribute to this tiny pathetic little life and um, he was the same size when he died as when he, as when he was born. Uh, but one of his friends said, you know, although Christopher couldn't grow, he helped other people to grow. And it was a strange truth that the value of this little life, we could see something special. In fact, we could see something of God in that little baby. He too was made in God's image. And so we see the meaning of love most clearly not in the powerful, not in the strong, not in the perfect person for humanity, but we see it in those who struggle often, those who are weak, those who are vulnerable, and the profound Christian message is above all we see it in the body of a man on a cross. And I'll close with this. Christian love is a way of saying to another, it's good that you exist. That's a sort of expression, a summary of, um, you know, it, it's interesting that so often what we're saying to one another in society is it's bad that you exist. The world would be much better if you didn't exist. But ultimately, Christian love will always say to other people, it's good that you exist. If you're interested in want to follow up particularly some of these issues about medical ethics and matters of life and death, if you'll forgive some self-publicity, there's a book over there. Um, retail price is now 16.99, but to you, once only, offer five pounds. So there are a few copies of the book over there. And thanks very much for listening. Thank you very much. And uh, we would really invite you to have a read and investigate these claims. And we hope that really it will help you to have this gift if it is true. And uh, also, uh, so, uh, there are uh, two books 
over there on the bookstore. One of them is uh, the book we just talked about, uh, Matters of Life and Death, and it's five pounds over there. And uh, the other book, which became a tab phenomenon, which I'm not going to mention more, and uh, it is uh, written by one of the guys here, and uh, it is discussing the evidence for the existence of God, and uh, it's free for you to take away, and it's just over there. We have limited copies. And, uh, yeah, please text in your questions and uh, also there will be feedback forms inside those copies of Gospels and we'd really like to know your answers honestly how we did today and uh, you can be as not British as possible <laughs> and uh, yes, okay, thanks very much. Well, not so bad. <laughs> Tab phenomenon, really. Um, okay, so we're going to get the questions. Keep texting them in. We've had a few already. Um, just to say, we were, gonna, we we're aiming to finish at five two, um, so the people with lectures um, can go. Um, after which time, we have the room booked for another hour. So if you want to chat with John, John will be available. Um, right, let's get the questions. We've got a few texts already. Um, nice easy one to begin with. Did God create evil? <laughs> Yeah, well, an easy one to start with. Um, interestingly, the commonest picture that is used in the Bible and in Christian thinking about evil is the, is the contrast between light and darkness. And if you think about it, that's a very profound thing, that darkness actually doesn't have an existence in itself. It is, it is simply what happens when you abstract light from somewhere. And so there may well be something profound saying about the nature of evil that the, 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 the most profound fundamental thing you can say about evil is, it, is, is that what happens when God withdraws and so uh, I, I think that gives a different twist on this, this question and of course that doesn't explain anything ultimately and you know, I, I, I will take refuge in this idea that reality is stranger than we can possibly think I think if I could explain where evil comes from you know, if human minds were able to have a nice and neat explanation for the nature of evil you can, you can bet your bottom dollar that that would turn out to lead to far greater evil so I think probably you know, those are ex an example of some of the deep mysteries of reality which we're not allowed to know because it would be far too dangerous for us to know. Um, would anyone like to uh, chop their hand up? Uh, we can take a question from the floor if anyone wants to. Otherwise we can just continue with the texts. No, okay, cool. Um, is it possible morality was constructed to give us the evolutionary advantage? Well, it is possible, and I, I discussed that. Um, and, uh, you know, it is possible. They, they, these are often called just-so stories. The problem with evolutionary psychology and any kind of evolutionary uh, argumentation is that it's almost always possible to construct, however implausible, a set of circumstances where the altruistic behavior or whatever kind of, of moral activity uh, w w leads to a survival advantage. Uh, you know, and, and whatever, that, but that's is where there's a problem for uh, evolutionary morality because you know evolutionary morality can be used to just for everything. So as I said in the example of the chap who was beheaded by ISIS, you can use evolutionary explanations for the activity of both people on that side, but it doesn't tell you uh, whether it's it's right or wrong. Um, and, and certainly, if you think about the example of the woman who sacrifices her life for these children who are totally unrelated to her. It's quite hard to, to you have to get to have to do quite a lot of work to give an evolutionary explanation for why sacrificing her own life for children who are unrelated to her is is an action which she thinks is morally right. If God is the pinnacle of morality, how do we account for the creation of natural disasters, wars, and even individual uh, mass murders slash pedophiles and other evil humans? Well, and of course, that is one of those profound uh, questions about uh, related to the origin of evil, which has been around for more than 2,000 years. And I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have a simple answer. One of the interesting ideas which uh, comes again out from the Christian uh, Revelation, in which some Christian theologians have talked about, is the idea that there is something which comes before the Big Bang. There is something which comes before the foundation of the earth, and that is the story of the cross. It's a story of good and evil. And in fact, the entire cosmos, starting from the Big Bang, is a sort of theatre 
in which a great narrative is going to be enacted. And we shouldn't be surprised, therefore, to find that the whole theatre actually written into the, the cosmos is in some weird way a, a, a narrative, a story of good and evil. And uh, in, in, a, in a, a strange way, our lives, our little pathetic lives, can get caught up into this grand narrative. And this is a, this is a theme which you can see uh, in, in the Bible from time to time. So, in some ways, it seems to me that this mystery of good and evil actually goes before the Big Bang. Um, but more than that is very hard to say. Ultimately, suffering is a mystery. I, uh, you know, I've wrestled a lot with human suffering from my own experience, and, and particularly as a baby doctor. And one of the quotes which has meant a lot to me is this, suffering is not a, and it's the same could be true with, with say about evil, suffering and pain is not a question which demands an answer, it's not a problem which demands a solution, it's a mystery which demands a presence. In other words, our calling is not to explain evil and suffering, it's to be there. Um, I just got a text saying, sorry, I can't type. Um, <laughs> we're receiving the one more, I'll squeeze it in, so if you um, try to keep it short. Um, if God is a moral one, why would he allow humans to choose to be non-moral, thus making him um, look guilty of indifference of human suffering? And again, a huge challenging question, but it seems to, uh, drawing out from the Christian understanding of morality, is that God, of course, could have made us as automata, he could have made us so that we were programmed to do good things. He could also have made the world like a sort of cosmic nursery, so that even if we did bad things, as soon as you took up a knife to stab someone, it turned, it went floppy. As soon as you tried to kill someone, the gun jammed. It was like a sort of kindergarten world, where you couldn't do any serious harm, where your actions never had serious consequences because God would always intervene. Um, I think when you stop and think about it, you realize that actually living in a kindergarten universe or living like an automaton that is just merely programmed to do good things is in some way less than being fully human, less than the way that God has created us. So God gave us the greatest, most wonderful thing he possibly could give out of his love for us, and that is he made us to reflect his own image. And therefore, because God is a free God, a God who chooses, a God who has, a, who has more Morality, a God who is faithful to his own character, he gives to his creations the most precious thing he can do, which is to reflect that image. And therefore we live in a real world, a world where actually your consequence, your actions and decisions are going to have consequences, where you are going to face life and death decisions, and a real world where, where we all live in, and yet the choices we make will have consequences not only for our lives, but actually in some weird way for eternity. Thank you very much for answering the questions and asking the questions, of course. Um, thank you very much for coming. And uh, we really want you to continue discussion with people and with, from the Christian Union and, uh, and John himself. And uh, we would really love you to hand in the feedback form as you go out. So Leonard over there, he's going to be... Raise your hand, Leonard. So, okay. Then he's going to collect your feedback forms and we really lo would like to see them. And the room is booked for another hour and uh, you're free to stay around and enjoy the rest of food is there any left. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for coming and we hope to see you in future Christian Union events. Thank you very much.